Welcome to the Just Raise podcast, now on video. I'm your host, Joe Sweeney, and today on the show, we're talking to one of the most amazing companies on the planet, or off the planet. Our guest is Peter Beck, founder and CEO of Rocket Lab. Rocket Lab is the world's second largest rocket company. So other than SpaceX, they're the only ones to put anything in orbit, from satellites to payloads, That makes them a pretty critical part of the new infrastructure being built in space. They're driving down launch costs, which makes it easier and cheaper to get to orbit. And their Electron rocket has already put over 100 satellites in space. Peter Beck is an aerospace engineer by training and started the company in New Zealand way back in 2006. He actually led engineering and design of the company's first Electron rocket and just last year in 2021, brought the company public via SPAC at a valuation of $4 billion. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Peter Beck. Peter, it is fantastic to have you on the show. To dive right in, uh, give us a little bit of background on Rocket Lab and the election uh, and the Electron rocket. So, what is it delivering into space? Who are your customers? How long has uh, Rocket Lab been around? And um, what's the, what are the next steps for the company? Sure. So, I mean, I originally um, started Rocket Lab, <clears throat> excuse me, down in New Zealand in 2006, um, and it wasn't until really 2014 when uh, we actually. Uh, flipped over to being uh, a U.S. company and um, and raised some capital out of Silicon Valley, uh, and we started the Electron program. Um, now the Electron is a small launch vehicle, lifts about 300 kgs into low Earth orbit, uh, designed purpose, you know, for the explicit purpose of delivering small satellites um, in, into into low Earth orbit. Uh, currently today, it's the uh, second most frequently launched U.S. vehicle, and actually the fourth most frequently lo- launched rocket in the entire world. Um, we've delivered over 100 uh, of our customer satellites into a wide range of, of orbits, um, and, uh, and, and uh, it's, it's become kind of the, the, the staple of the, the small launch um, industry. Yeah, it, it's pretty amazing how many you have put into orbit at this point and, and just how many launches these rockets have done. Uh, so to dive right into the rockets to start, can we? T- I would love to hear about how you build them. And maybe for our listeners who aren't in the space industry, you know, what really makes up a rocket? What are the major modules and what does it take to put one of these in the air? Yeah, so I mean, I, I should temper, <laughs> excuse me, I should temper it with um, uh, a kind of a less known fact that there's only been a couple of private companies, you know, SpaceX being one of them, Rocket Lab, that have actually, you know, built a launch vehicle and delivered a satellite into orbit. Um, in the space industry right now, there's a tremendous amount of excitement, but actually, uh, you know, there's only been a couple of companies that have that have done it, and this is fundamentally because it's just really hard to do. Um, and to kind of answer your question, uh, between sort of two and three percent of the total rocket's mass is actually the satellite you send to orbit. So in the case of Electron, it's 95 percent fuel by weight, um, three or four percent, uh, two or three percent of you know of the actual satellite mass um, by weight, and the rest is structures. So you can see that your tanks and all your engines have to be incredibly lightweight and incredibly high performance. Um, and and that, that's what makes it difficult because if you're a fraction of a percent out on your trajectory or on your propellant loading or your performance, then you just get nothing to space. It's uh, like a $10 million firework. I think it's one of those things that if you wrote everything down on a piece of paper, um, all the things that had to work, all the things you had to achieve. I mean, we, we also built a launch site down in New Zealand, which required a bilateral treaty between New Zealand and America. It required a whole new space law in New Zealand. Uh, we built the first and only private orbital launch site, which meant we had to build many kilometres of roads. We had to put tracking stations around the world. We had to upgrade the entire internet backhaul to a township um, and so on and so forth. So if you write everything down on a piece of paper, you would think that that is unlikely to succeed. Um, and that, that is this business. This is the rocket business. Um, there's so many things that have to come together perfectly. And I think the best way I can describe building a rocket company is like, running through them running through like a maze at night and at every dead end there's, there's somebody with a shotgun 
And you have to run quickly through the maze because you can, you've got a time limit, but you also have to peer your head around the corners very gently because if you run down a dead end, you are going to die. That is a sure thing. So, um, and th this is this is why that I think uh, there's been very few successful, um, you know, private space companies or launch companies is just that. That maze is just a very unforgiving maze. Um, so by all accounts, you've been making rockets since you were a kid and you don't have a background coming from another tech company or uh, or have, uh, I assume, your own billions to pour into the industry. <laughs> you really come from a background as an engineer um, and decided to start this 15 years ago. What drove you to start this company and what drives you to keep going over this 15 year long journey to get rockets into space to the point where now you're the second largest private rocket company and uh, growing fast. So yeah, I, I come from the smallest town you can possibly imagine at the very bottom of the South Island of New Zealand, where it's kind of like Antarctica. So um, yes, I guess uh, un unlikely beginnings, but um, for me personally, it's always, it's always been about space. Um, there's two passions in my life, um, and, and that is kind of, you know, engineering and, and entrepreneurship. And um, so for me, uh, you know, I started the company at basically uh, uh, after I didn't see anybody doing what I fundamentally thought was important to do and, uh, and just, just getting on with it. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, 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 I guess the thing that, that really caused me to start the company and the thing that continues to you know, energize me and keep me excited today is really um, the power that space has over everybody down here on Earth. Like when, when, when <coughs> excuse me, when you launch a satellite, um, you launch that satellite and, um, you know, it, it travels around the planet every 90 minutes. So, you know, we launched some weather satellites a few years ago. They provide weather data to New Zealand. They provide weather data to the US, UK and all around the world. And space is really the only domain where you can put something in orbit, a piece of infrastructure in orbit that can have an impact to literally millions or billions of people. And that's what I find the most exciting. And if, if you walk into any of Rocket Lab's facilities, you know, the first thing you're, you're greeted with is a sign that says we go to space to improve life on Earth. And that is, that is you know, the fundamental crux of, of the, you know, the origins of the company. So that, that's what I get excited about. I love the engineering, I love the challenge. Um, I'm drawn to things that are really, really hard, um, but uh, ultimately it's it's the payoff um, where you can actually, uh, you know, have a positive effect on a large number of people. So the driving factor for a lot of the demand for launch providers right now, and launch providers are still definitely the bottleneck to get into space, uh, obviously. Um, but a lot of the demand comes from these CubeSat companies. And two mm. of the biggest are uh, Planet Labs and Spire. Uh, we just had Peter Platzer, the CEO of Spire, on the show. And, uh, you know, it's it's interesting because th those have kind of largely been driven by the computing going down from a mainframe to a PC to mobile and being able to put cheap uh, computing into these tiny bread box size satellites. But what are you most excited about that has an impact on the Earth? Because on the CubeSat side, there's a lot going on, but I'm always interested in kind of what the next angle is as far as business models and sensors and just products that will create a new company um, in this new emerging ecosystem in low earth orbit. Yeah, so I think I think there's, there's kind of two really interesting niches. Um, so one is uh, obviously the small side, which, um, uh, which, you know, we have the electron product to service. And um, yeah, they're CubeSats, but they're also, um, I would say, the majority of our satellites that we launch are sort of around that 80 to 100 kg class, um, as well as as well as CubeSats, of course. I mean, CubeSats are a wonderful um, low-cost method of developing either large constellations, but also, you know, learning as you, you go into space. And then the kind of the, the second niche, I would say, is in the mega constellations. And that's what our larger launch vehicle, the Neutron vehicle, is, is, is aiming to, uh, to address. Those are the kind of, um, you know, various, uh, you know, niches with, with it, within the industry. But I would have to say that um, the biggest thing yet to be done in space is yet to even be thought of. 
um, we're in a very fortunate position where um, we get to see customers' early business plans and early ideas because either they're looking for a launch or they're looking for some components out of our space systems division. And I would, I would have to say that, you know, the, the business models that have been announced are, in, are interesting, exciting, but the ones that haven't are even more interesting and exciting. And I think, uh, you know, we're really at the beginning of um, how we utilize space as a new domain. So the biggest project is, is yet to be done. Um, I think you can see great utility in like internet from space. Um, <clears throat> that, that's clearly an interesting market, but I think there's other markets that uh, are really, really large. And I guess the best analogy I can think of is, is if, you, if you want to compare the space industry to the internet, we're at the point where we've just kind of received our first email and we're all kind of standing around that computer going, oh, uh, isn't this cool? We've got an email. What else can this crazy little box in the corner be good for? So um, I think that's really where we are in, uh, with, you know, at the beginning in, in the space industry right now. Yeah, I think that's one of the most exciting parts is just that as this platform gets built and you know the uh, the launch providers are really the platform that enables space what can you do on that platform mm. um to come back to the rockets uh you mentioned just how hard they are and that it's almost entirely fuel by percentage um and that if you're off by a couple percentage points you or fractions of a percentage point you don't get into space to really uh to 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 dive in there, I guess my next question is why uh, why why would a couple percentage points knock it off? And really, why are these so hard? And then I guess that leads into um, what I want to ask you next about reusable rockets, which are yeah. novel uh, and something that you and only a few other companies are doing. Well, firstly, I mean physics sucks. That's why it's so hard. <laughs> I mean, if, if gravity was like 9.1 instead of 9.81, it would be incredibly much simpler to get anything into orbit. Um, but th the reality is that um, we're burning dinosaurs to get to space. Um, and even when you burn dinosaurs at the most efficient way possible, like 98% combustion efficiency, it's just enough performance by the time you shed bits in, of your rocket as you ascend and you use the you know the lightest weight materials and tanks you can you can you can conjure up. Um, that's what you end up with. I think it's like five percent of the best payload fact you know a mass fraction you can you can practically achieve. So it's just physics. You just every day you wake up and you put your socks on, you get out of bed, and you do battle with physics every day. You're battling with material strength, material sciences. There's, I mean, there there is nothing left to be had from burning dinosaurs. So that's 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 the hand that you are dealt. So that makes it very, very difficult. Now, I'll give you an example of like residual fuel. Um, so residual, residual fuel in the second stage, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So for every kilo of fuel that you don't burn, don't burn, that's equivalent to one kilo of payload or satellite that you can't lift. So, you know, when you are actually deploying your spacecraft and you're doing that second stage burn, if you ever watch a live stream, you'll see right at the very end of the burn, all the velocity comes on as the stage gets lighter and lighter and lighter and your fuel tank's getting empty and empty and emptier. And it's literally the last kind of 10 to 15 seconds that you actually, you know, achieve the velocity you need to achieve. And at that point, you know, you're down to, in the case of Electron, you're down to just a few kilograms. Like imagine a, a, a household bucket. That's all the fuel you've got left. Um, and if you have two of those buckets, then, you know, it's too much mass. So, um, you know, it, it's just everything is against you um, to try and make, make this work. And then, of course, um, making it work once is relatively easy, actually, as it turns out. Um, making it work 20 times or, you know, even 10 times is infinitely more hard than making it work once. And I think I look back very fondly to our first few flights thinking, you know, how simple and uh, glorious those times were. But when you get into the much higher numbers, you start to push against all of the, um, all of the corner cases that you've never, you know, that you had designed for, all of, all of the statistics that start stacking up against you. And that's when you start to see, you know, issues creep in. Uh, so in order to, to, you know, produce rockets at a mass production level and fly them reliably, Man, that's like an order of magnitude harder than just getting your first one on orbit. 
Yeah, that's amazing. And these rockets are are about sixty feet tall. Um, it's it's they're they're pretty incredible. I think we're well known for the Electron small launch vehicle, but actually, you know, a big chunk of our business is space systems. So we build satellites too. Um, and then the really cool thing is we combine satellites with rockets. Um, you know, the Photon satellite is is able to be completely and seamlessly integrated into Electron, and that's been a very successful product for us. Um, you know, we have a number uh, of those on orbit now. Um, and but the you know the spacecraft division is is building really cool stuff. I mean, we have a couple of missions to uh, to Mars. We've got the Capstone mission, which you see the the spacecraft behind me, uh, to the Moon later this year. Uh, so um, you know that that that's really exciting. And as I look at space companies, um, I think ultimately space companies are going to end up being satellite and launch companies uh, because it's just incredibly powerful when you have both the ability to build a satellite and a rocket all under the one roof. So I think, you know, as, as Rocket Lab goes forward, um, you know, we, we're looking to continue to expand our space systems division and combine that with the launch offering. Because ultimately, if you talk to um, spacecraft operators, uh, they don't actually want to operate spacecraft. The whole point of going to space is to just provide data or services uh, to us down on Earth. So designing, building, operating, launching your own spacecraft is just a bit of a giant pain in the butt, honestly. So if all you need to do is provide a data service uh, or a particular you know, um, thing to us down on Earth, then uh, it would be great if somebody else could you know, take care of all of that. Um, and that's, that's ultimately what we're doing. So you know, Rocket Lab is a company, um, we're, we're, we're building this first end-to-end -end space systems company where there's launch under one roof, satellites under one roof. Uh, we even have customers where we, um, you know, we, we haven't built the satellite, we haven't launched a satellite, but we actually manage their assets on orbit. So it's a complete end-to-end -end service. Yeah, I think it's amazing how uh, by building these rockets, you then get to a scale where it enables new business lines. Like I think most of the other uh, space companies that I know of are pretty single product at the moment in that they don't have a wider array and they usually aren't providing parts uh, as far as I know, um, which is, it's, it's an interesting model. Uh, the other thing is that means that you actually make all the parts or a lot of the parts in house, if you're shipping them to other people, as opposed to, you know, having supply chains and suppliers that ship you just about everything. I know you actually 3d print the engines of the electron, um, which I'm curious about why you do that specifically as well, but what is your supply chain and manufacturing look like in house versus, uh, versus relying on outside suppliers? Well, I mean, from from a vertically integrated standpoint, I think Rocket Lab is is probably the most vertically integrated space company you can possibly imagine. I mean, we even, you know, at some at some point built roads rather than uh, employed contractors. So, uh, so incredibly uh, vertically integrated, um, and I think that is by far uh, secret of our success. Um, and to your point, that you know, the the space um, supply chain is is very fragile and very subscale. Um, and that's fundamentally one of the reasons why we bought Sinclair Interplanetary um, was because for our satellite components business, um, there was no, uh, you know, no real option at, at scale for reaction wheels and star trackers. So um, that, that's one of the fundamental reasons why we bought that company. Um, so, you know, you end up doing a lot yourself um, and then having control over the schedule and the cost of the price and, uh, and your supply chain is, is critically important. And I think you know, throughout COVID, um, we really didn't uh, didn't experience you know too many issues on our supply chain because, well, actually, the majority of the supply chain is within Rocket Lab's roof. So for us, it's literally raw materials in one end, rocket out the other. And you know, at the moment, we're producing one rocket about every 20 days. Um, so uh, that 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 works really well. And then um, with respect to the 3D printing question, I mean, you know, we started 3D printing engines when it, it was it was kind of considered weird. Um, I, I remember, um, you know, metal 3D printing was hailed as the, the you know, the, the solution to cat prosthetics. That was like, it's going to be, it's, it's kind of, you know, the thing that everybody would, would use 3D printing for. And, you know, we'd go to trade fairs and they'd be printing, you know, cat's prosthetics and, and bottle openers. And we said, well, we want to, you know, we want to print rocket engines. You know, we want to have the throats of a rocket engine running white hot. Um, and everybody sort of just looked at us funny. So, but we invested in some early 3D printing equipment 
and really pioneered a lot of the um, early material development um, and, and printing techniques uh, and produced the Rutherford rocket engine. Um, and, uh, you know, we print a, a Rutherford rocket engine now, I think it's like every 24, 24 hours, there's over 200 of those engines gone to space. Um, so, uh, you know, and you know, that, that's, the 3D printing was really um, fundamental for us to, you know, increase uh, flight rate and reduce cost significantly. And, you know, today, I think everybody 3D prints their rocket engine. If you're not 3D printing your rocket engine, you know, there's, you're not cool. And uh, there's even some companies that are, you know, proposing to 3D print the entire rocket. So, um, you know, certainly, um, you know, 3D printers have, have been, um, you know, in instrumental in, in the, the really, you know, complex structures. Yeah, that's amazing. I worked at uh, 3D Systems uh, a, a while ago, um, and I have a bottle opener. But uh, yeah. I think that was <laughs> you have a cat prosthetic. That's the real question. No, no, I have a model of a of a human skull. But yeah, it's um, it's it, it's really interesting. So those are 3D printed titanium, I'm guessing, or is it carbon fiber? No, they're they're in canal super alloys uh, for the combustion chambers. And, gotcha. Uh, the and yeah. I have a question on unit economics about the rockets in general too. Yeah, ro rocket unit economics. This is you. You could you could do a whole thesis in that um, because some, some some things scale very very well and some things scale not so well. So uh, you know the quality the quality control team on Electron is the same size as the team that is required on a large launch vehicle. So, you know, some things scale and some things don't. But I think, um, you know, one thing that we've been very, very clear on from day one was uh, let's design the most manufacturable rocket possible. Um, and every design decision we made from day one, whether, whether it be use of materials or 3D printing or whatever, was always designed to be the lowest possible cost and the highest possible performance. Um, at the end of the day, um, you know, going, going to space, it's not like, uh, it's just we go there and that, it's it. No mission that Rocket Lab has ever flown is the same. Every mission has something slightly different, a bit of a different trajectory, a new secondary structure. Um, you know, we've done flights where we've deployed some customers and then we've raised an orbit and deployed some more customers. Uh, we have instantaneous launch windows for some customers. Um, so it's it's really, you know, every mission is, is, is very, very different. Um, the best thing you can do, of course, is to make uh, you know your launch vehicle as, as cheap as you can, but also um, it has to be very reliable, and it also has to do all of the things that um, that it need you need it to do to be competitive in um, the small launch market. Uh, if because if if you build a rocket that can just go to an orbit uh, and do nothing else, um, then you you'll get eaten by rideshare, uh, where you can put you know your spacecraft on a large rocket and just get to an orbit. Um, you know, the, the real um, sales pitch or the, the real value that's created with small dedicated launch is you get to the orbit in your time frame. Um, so if you build a rocket that just gets to any orbit on any time frame and not very reliably, then, um, you, you know, you, you, you just you don't have a business. So um, we were very, very careful to create and develop the, the electron launch vehicle to be highly reliable, but also uh, reach the widest amount of azimuth inclinations, altitudes, and just we've done crazy stuff on orbit, just about done backflips for customers on orbit. So crazy, crazy stuff. Um, but that's what's required to be competitive in this market. Yeah, so that touches on competition. And I think that business model for smaller rockets is really interesting because, you know, SpaceX is launching the Falcon Heavy, which can carry humans and is super effective. You can get a ride share uh, on one of those and it will then deploy your satellite. Um, but it goes wherever the Falcon Heavy is going, not mm -hmm. wherever you want to go. And it goes whenever it goes. It goes. It, SpaceX missions could be delayed, um, have been delayed up to a year, and you know they'll probably be more frequent in the future. But they uh, run on their schedule. Whereas if you're launching much cheaper rockets, uh, 
to all over on, you know, you're printing them every, you're making them every 24 days now or something along those lines. So you can launch them super frequently. I saw a timeline on your website up to every 72 hours um, once you get to scale. So that unlocks a whole different access. Can you talk about why different orbits matter and those timelines and kind of what that business model of that whole layer of launch providers uh, is going to look like? Absolutely. So, I mean, the best way to think about it is that if I said to you, um, well, say, say you had a de- you, need, you needed to get to London. Let's just say you needed to get to London. And I said to you, okay, um, here's a free ticket. It's, take, it's going to Australia, but it's free. Um, it doesn't help you in the least because you're trying to get to London. So um, at some point, uh, it doesn't even matter if the launch is free. If it's not going to the right destination, uh, it, it doesn't matter because you know, ultimately, you know, space is not space. Space is, is a very specific destination, and in that destination enables you to be commercial with your you know, particular satellite or constellation. Um, you know, if you've got an Earth observation satellite and you get launched in the dark, um, and you know, it, it, the spacecraft spends the majority of its time in, in the dark, then it's, it's pretty useless, right? I mean, you want a sun-synchronous orbit at a particular time of the day so that it's light, so you can take photos. Um, so there's really, uh, you know, really quite well-defined requirements around, um, you know, building these commercial platforms and having that flexibility of destination is really, really important. Um, and then, of course, having, having your, your schedule certainty is really, really important. And I would say that, you know, Rocket Lab's customers on Electron fall into two categories. Uh, the first category is they understand the power of a small dedicated launch. They've baked it into their business model and uh, everything's just, calm and easy. And then the other group of customers are customers that uh, have either um, decided that um, they've they wanted to go into rideshare and they've waited a year and their satellite has sat on the shelf for a year and uh, generated no revenue. And they realize that all of a sudden, generally really quickly, that um, it's far better to just pay the extra price that it costs for a dedicated vehicle uh, so that you can get your satellite on orbit and actually you would have had a year's worth of revenue generated from that satellite. So, so those are kind of the screamers that come in and then the ones that, um, that, uh, that, that you know, have baked it into their business model on, on day one. So um, they're very much bisect into those two, two group of customers. Yeah, it's never occurred to me that, you know, if you end up in an Earth synchronous orbit where your satellite's moving around the same speed as the Earth is is spinning and you end up in the dark, you... <laughs> you're only in the dark um, from forever onwards. That's that's really interesting. I, I'd also love to talk about with that and some of the projects and missions that you've talked about, like the Capstone mission, mm-hmm. the mission to the moon, um, the future of Rocket Labs and some of those yeah. missions. So could you just tell us what Project uh, Capstone is and then maybe we can go from there and dive into a little bit of what's going on in on the moon in general? Sure. <clears throat> so the Capstone mission, um, you know, it's it's a it's a NASA mission where we're providing you know the ride to get the, the Capstone spacecraft into uh, cislunar orbit, and um, that's really to test uh, this this new orbit around the moon to enable uh, you know staging and astronauts uh, to uh, to have a stable orbit around the moon to you know, obviously land on the moon, but also take you know go to other destinations uh, including Mars. So it's really a, a pathfinder for that that kind of new stable orbit um, around the moon. So we're incredibly, uh, you know, incredibly lucky to be selected to, you know, you know, to deliver this mission because it's a very obviously it's an important mission, but it's 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 also a very complicated mission. And um, look, you know, going into planetary or to the moon is is no joke. I mean, uh, this is a seriously hard thing to do. Getting to orbit, man, at this point, getting to orbit, like you just do it with your eyes closed, with your hands behind your back. Going to you know setting out on a on a you know lunar capture trajectory that's a whole nother deal of of you know of hard to do um, so uh, so so that you know that that that's an exciting mission uh, for us and it really it continues along our path of you know interplanetary and uh, and, and you know complicated uh, missions that we, we we really do love doing. I, out of curiosity, how much does it cost to get to the moon these days? If I, you know, if I was NASA and wanted to put a satellite into a lunar orbit, well, that's what's really exciting about this mission is this is a ten million dollar mission. So, uh, you know, for ten million dollars, uh, we, we take an electron and a photon interplanetary and go to the moon. 
um, and we have missions, you know, a private mission to Venus is, is, you know, same sort of value again. I mean, who would have thought that you could go to Venus for, for some 10 or, 10 or more million dollars? It's just incredible. Yeah, ten. I mean, ten million dollars is amazing. That's a that's a Series A for, or that's like a small round for tech companies. I just yep. saw that um, uh, uh, Firefly won a contract to build NASA's first lunar lander um, on land on the moon, which is about a hundred million dollars. So mm. it just strikes me that the cost to actually get to the moon and to get to, I guess, some of these other places as well, but you know, the moon specifically is really low. Um, yeah. So do you think we're going to have infrastructure being built on the moon? So things like bases with people in them or just more facil- facilities and uh, infrastructure roads on the moon in the next, you know, well, I'm not building a road on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard enough on earth, let alone in the moon. No, I, look, I think this is, this is a super exciting time in space, right? I mean, I think, this is, uh, I, I used to wake up in the morning wishing I was born during the Apollo era, but I think this is the time to be alive in the space industry because um, there's so much commercial activity, uh, so much opportunity in space, and uh, there's just so many cool things going on. And I think either way you look at it, um, humans are hard-coded to explore. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just, you know, who we are as a species. Um, so, you know, lunar exploration will happen. Uh, interplanetary exploration will happen. Um, it just, you know, on what timeline is really the question for me. And, and uh, I have no, no doubts that you know, there will be a moon base at some point in time uh, and, and probably a, a city on Mars too. It's just, uh, just inevitable. Um, if you follow the thesis of human exploration, that's, those things are going to happen. I, I hope many of them happen in my lifetime, and I certainly hope that we can be a part of some of them. Um, certainly with the Capstone mission, that we, we, we're forming a, a very small but important part of uh, returning to the moon. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, let, let, let's just hope they all happen in our lifetime. Yeah, that is, uh, that is, that is wild. Um, and really, really exciting. Um, so the, the other topic that I'd love to touch on, uh, is about raising capital. So, mm-hmm. Space companies, like you said, now is one of the most exciting times in space. And um, there are a ton of new CubeSat and uh, small satellite companies getting formed. There are a couple of other companies, but there are only really a few launch providers. And, you know, like you, they've been around for a long time. And raising capital has traditionally been, uh, I I imagine, difficult. Um, But you've accomplished, obviously, a huge amount. What is it? been like raising capital for rocket labs and how has that evolved up to the point where now you know you've just you have the SPAC where you're going to be going public at a four billion dollar valuation yeah so i think you know when we when when i came over to silicon valley i mean i I, you have to put it into context so i i left new zealand jumped on a plane and i gave myself three weeks to come home with a check or be run out of town and i knew nothing i didn't i knew absolutely nothing about silicon valley um all i knew is that that's the place to go to raise capital and, you know, the first week I spent there uh, talking to a bunch of companies, not space companies, just companies to try and figure out how that whole ecosystem and everything worked. And then uh, we only actually ended up pitching to like three companies. Um, and I think it, being really, really selective about the, the, the capital that you bring is uh, into your business is super important. Um, and that, that's, that's kind of, you know, step number one. But when I was running around the valley um, trying to raise money for a rocket company, uh, it was definitely fringe. Um, now I would say that um, just about every, you know, tier one VC has got some money in a rocket company somewhere. Um, so it's it's much much simpler. Um, I would say that we, you know, we never we've never had troubles raising um, private equity. We've always been very successful in raising private equity. And I think that's primarily stemmed from you know we do what we say we're going to do. Like if we said in the A round you know, we're going to build a, an electrically pumped engine and we're going to run it and we're going to build these carbon composite tanks and we're going to prove that they can work. And you know, every time we raised a round, we, we executed against what we said we were going to do. Um, if I look at the capital that's flowing now into the industry and especially into the launch vehicle industry, I'm kind of that guy standing in the corner just scratching his head going, hang on a minute, where, where was I when all this was going on? Because uh, it seems way too easy for these kids now. This is this is this used to be real tough. Um so, uh, but but I think that's ultimately that's a really really wonderful thing because uh, the more capital that flows into the industry, the better. Now, the the challenge here is execution. Um, 
because the space industry is incredibly exciting. Everybody gets excited about rockets and you know, space travel and all of these things. But, um, you know, there has to be execution. And uh, with all this capital flowing, um, there's going to have to be really, really good execution So because investors are going to want to see returns uh, for, for those large amounts of, of, of capital. So um, I think I think that is that's that's the, you know, the both the wonderful thing right now about the space industry and also the challenging thing. But if you are thinking about starting up your own space company, now is the time to do it. That is really really the time to do it. So I would I would encourage anybody to, you know, to 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 get on with that job. What are the next steps of Rocket Lab that you're most excited about? So you we talked about a bit about the different missions, but uh, what comes next? So, I mean, as, as you kind of uh, briefly mentioned there, we, we're becoming a publicly listed company on the NASDAQ uh, here in in, uh, in, in, the, in a very short period of time, actually. And um, for me, this is this is super exciting for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, we've always had a bit of an acquisition thesis within the company. Uh, you know, if we can do it internally, we always will. If we can um, if we can acquire it and, and ingest it, uh, uh, then then we'll do that as well. And uh, we've already had a really successful acquisition with Sinclair Interplanetary. Um, going public really, uh, you know, it's not for the faint-hearted, but the reason why we did it is kind of two fundamental reasons. Um, access to capital is, is great, but I mean, we've never had any issues raising capital, so that's that's neither neither here nor there. But actually, having a public currency is super important uh, to be able to to do those really large acquisitions and um, and, and have that public currency to go and, uh, and and grow the company in a much more significant rate. Uh, you know, I, I look I look at where we are now compared to where we were uh, even on the Electron program. You know, as we start the, the much larger rocket, the Neutron program, here we are. Um, you know, we, we have all the capital we need, of course, but um, but we also have all the experience. Um, and you know, I think about operating Electron uh, and then also uh, recovering Electron and trying to you know, transition that into a reusable platform. And now, you know, I'm just so excited because we have this public currency. We have a blank sheet of paper uh, and all the experience and the war wounds and the knowledge to go and build a vehicle that will be truly disruptive within the industry. Um, I know a lot of people are building rockets right now, um, and uh, you know, apart from us, none of them have actually flown. Um, and there's there's a lot to learn uh, in in that operational sense. I think of as I mentioned before, it's like I look back on our first flight with just such naivety that it was it was the hard bit. Um, and applying all those lessons now to 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 building uh, a much larger space company with space systems and being publicly traded, I think um, now I'm start I'm just starting to get excited. Uh, we can we can really start to put the pedal down now. It, when you think about acquisitions, what portion of the business, when you think like business lines, would the, one of those acquisitions fit best for Rocket Labs or Rocket yeah. Lab? So if you if you take uh, the Sinclair acquisition we did recently, um, that's a good example. So uh, we announced a photon program and we said, right, let's start building satellites. And then um, we'd already specced, uh, you know, Sinclair Interplanetary's uh, gear into our into our satellites because you know it's just beautiful jewelry, uh, beautiful stuff, um, and we like to build beautiful things. Uh, and um, you know, Doug and his team is amazing, but you know they're, they're used to producing sort of 150. Uh, reaction wheels a year, and you know we we have uh, we have thousands of reaction wheels a year that are required under some of our contracts now. Um, so you take a wonderfully engineered product and a great team, and then bolt it onto the side of Rocket Lab, you know a company that knows how to scale, and then scale those components, and uh, and and all of a sudden reaction wheel Star Trek is zero issue for Rocket Lab. Like any of our spacecraft are not going to be gated with those with those particular um, you know components, uh, nor is anybody else's, because the space industry, especially the satellite part of the space industry, is full of you know un- subscale, very niche, um, small shops. So it's very difficult. I mean, you can go to just about any of the space com- you know satellite or space component shops and say I want ten thousand of something, and just watch the person's head explode. Um, literally in front of you. It's just not. It's just not a number that makes sense. Whereas, you know, in 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 the rest of the world, like ten thousand of anything is nothing. Like this is like a sample order. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you know, there needs to be in order for the space economy to really reach its potential, there needs to be scale here, and this is what we do very very well. So, 
um, the kind of acquisitions that we'll be looking to make will be uh, similar things like that, where we're very accretive to what we're trying to do, but also uh, to what everybody else is trying to build as well. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, well, my last question, uh, Peter, for everybody on the show is about your vision for the company. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see Rocket Labs in 20, 25 years? 20, 25 years. You realize that at Rocket Lab is a standing joke here. They're like one year of Rocket Lab is five Earth years. So <laughs> you're asking me to project that like 20 years. It's like saying, well, what, what does 100 years time look like? <laughs> And I love to ask that question because I'm 26 and Amazon was started the year before me. So 25 years is pretty much all of Amazon. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I think the definition of success for us is that um, we've built an enduring public company. Um, you know, uh, as you pointed out, I'm, I'm the, I think I'm the only non-billionaire in this industry to, to get something into space. And, you know, we've, we've tried to build a very, you know, long-term enduring company. And that's one of the reasons to go public as well is, you know, I'm not going to live forever. Um, so, but I want the company to live forever. Um, so that, that, that's kind of you know, fundamental to the success. And, but, but ultimately, I think if I'm lying on my deathbed and I look back and go, well, were we successful or were we not? Um, then the, really how that will be measured is, is how much impact we've had um, using space on every everyday life down here on Earth. So, uh, if, uh, if if we can we can lie back there and um, actually meaningfully and tangibly point to things that we've done to uh, you know to help everybody down uh, here on earth, I think then that is that is the ultimate definition of success for the company. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a amazing vision, and uh, I'm excited to see what's going to be launching out of New Zealand over the next couple of years. Um, we will be watching for sure. Peter, well, there'll be thank stuff there'll be stuff launched out of uh, out of the wallop site too so uh we there'll be stuff going up in the southern and northern hemisphere yeah gotcha uh, peter it's been great to have you on the show um thanks so much for coming on thanks joe i appreciate your time